I have the extraordinary pleasure now of being joined by Dr. Michael Fole, British born astronaut who's flown with um, NASA to the Space Station and the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, Michael, it's great to meet you. Um, you've logged over 22 hours of, of uh, spacewalking time. What, what's your most enduring memory of, of spacewalks? Actually, being a, an astronaut in a spacesuit is probably the ultimate in being an astronaut, period. And uh, it, when you first come out of an airlock, uh, and often it occurs somewhere around sunrise, and we go around the Earth every hour and a half, and we see sunrise and sunsets every hour and a half. Um, you come out into what looks like a black abyss, but um, it's kind of a fuzzy blue Earth, that's the Terminator, turning into a bright blue Earth that's ahead of you. And uh, as you come out, you're aware that it's just kind of tumbling out into this abyss towards the Earth. And you, you're struck by two things. One is just how, uh, how in far you could fall, and you are falling, <laughs> you're in free fall. But second, um, you, you're, over, you're struck by how beautiful the world is. And, and uh, because you only have this very, very thin faceplate between you and the vacuum of space and the Earth, it's extraordinarily impressive. And then after that, um, you, you kind of naturally kind of look for something to hold, uh, just to make sure you're tethered for one thing. Um, but second, it's, it's more a matter of, I think, instinctive sort of, sort of security. And then you sort of relax and your heart settles down and uh, you start to enjoy the view as you go around the Earth. And then when you get to the other side of uh, the Earth from the sun, uh, cross the Terminator and you get onto the dark side, now you have this extraordinary view of the, uh, of the galaxy. And something that we just don't appreciate on Earth is because we're always, we always have the Earth in the way. But the, the galaxy, you know, we're in the middle of, the, of the, uh, arm, one of the arms of the galaxy and uh, spiral arms, two thirds of the way out from the center. And the whole lens is basically visible to you while you're uh, in your spacesuit doing a EVA. And you can see the bulge, well, no, parts of the bulge, because they're, they're all the black clouds there in the way. Um, but the colors of the stars are visible to you also. And so you, you have this range of, uh, of, of color that you don't, again, see when you look at the Milky Way from Earth, going all the way from the deep reds all the way up to you know, kind of greeny blue is the most. I can't pick out violet or anything. So it's, it's an amazing sensation. And that's just the view. And then, and then when you get to work, then that kind of takes away a little bit from this enjoyment because you now have to do something that they're paying you. Not, well, not paying you much for, but you've had this huge privilege of being there. Um, and it's very, very important that you do it right. Um, the space shuttle is launching soon uh, on another uh, mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope and the astronauts are going to be doing a lot of spacewalks on there. You've been on a, one of the Hubble repair missions. What, what kind of challenges will they face? Um, the, most, the, the challenge is huge responsibility. That's, that's the challenge they have. Um, I, 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 I'll give you an example. When I uh, was on uh, Discovery in, in 1999, we were on a kind of an emergency repair mission. It was HST servicing mission B. And uh, my job was to change out the computer of the telescope. They had to shut the com telescope completely down. And then we opened up panels. And Claude Nicolier, who was a, uh, is a Swiss astronomer, actually, and had been a long-term uh, ESA astronaut, he and I worked to uh, pull this computer out. But as we did it, we knew that if we broke this, or if we broke one of the thousand gold pins that we were putting in with our thick spacesuit gloves on, and, uh, we, and our suit's pressurized, of course, so we don't have tactile sensations like you have with, you know, in the lab. Um, if we broke it, we'd, it would be the most awful thing you could do to astronomy in history. It, it, so that feeling of responsibility was immense for me. And so when I, I, I talked to John Grunsfeld, who's the lead for uh, the Hubble repair mission coming up, and it's launching on May the, on May the 12th right now, it's STS 125, um, that they're, they're replacing two major instruments, um, but uh, and they should go pretty much per the plan. This is the Cosmic Origin Spectrometer and also uh, Wide Field Planetary Camera 3. But um, they're doing two repairs to older instruments that are still very, very critical to astronomy. And uh, those repairs are changing out circuit boards behind panels that never had screws designed for uh, people in uh, spacesuits to remove and capture and stop them from floating into the way of the optical path of the telescope. And that, that task that John uh, uh, is going to have to do is, is very, very difficult. He's going to have to reach around and behind, especially on the, this is ACS, the Advanced Camera for Service, which they're going to repair, has burned up forward. And he has to reach around behind it. He can't see what he's doing and then pull out these four boards and do it without breaking the pins, etc. Yeah. Now, he has, a, he has a tool to allow him to do that, but it's a very blind operation. And they only have two hours in this five EVA timeline. 
uh, to accomplish that. That is his greatest challenge. And of course, meanwhile, don't break the telescope. Uh, and so, so uh, it's, it's a huge responsibility. I mean, the space shuttle is crucial for the, the Hubble missions because it's the only vehicle that can get out there and, and do the job. Yeah, Hubble would have been a shadow of itself if we didn't have the space shuttle to repair it. Now, it, it could have used something other than the space shuttle to launch it, but the space shuttle and the astronauts were needed to repair it. And since then, we've had upgrades. You know, it's been in space almost 19 years. And uh, of course, CCDs, you know, detectors have all improved enormously. And as a result of that, um, the, the, the shuttle and the astronauts have been critical to those upgrades. Mm. With the shuttle program coming to an end, it looks like, in a year or two, what, what, what's, your, what's your feelings about that? Um, space Shuttle has its own uh, risks, um, and there's serious significant risks about um, both launch and entry um, to the crew. And that's all reflected in the lack of a, a good crew escape system. And so, yes, uh, we, we, NASA, need to move away from a vehicle that has no decent crew escape system. So we need a replacement. Um, so, in, so in the long term, I, I, I don't regret moving away from the Space Shuttle. However, we will truly regret the lack of the capability of the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle is an amazing vehicle in terms of what it's allowed us to do. And so that will be, it'll be a, a sad day when we have to worry about how much we can bring back from space. It'll be a sad day when we worry about being able to service satellites in space, and we can't, or not, not easily anyway. Um, my hope is that the next vehicle that we build, uh, right now it's Orion, um, is being planned, will have some means of doing orbits, orbital servicing, but that's not in the plan today. So we will miss the shuttle badly when it does its last flight, probably in 2010 or 11. Yeah, after the shuttle is retired, and, and the time period between the shuttle and Orion, uh, NASA will be relying on uh, Russian Soyuz capsules to get into space, is that correct? In, the, in the, what we call the gap years, from about <laughs> 2011, I think it's going to be now, until about well, whenever uh, the, another vehicle appears, 2016, say, that's a five-year gap. We will be mo almost entirely using the Soyuz to go to the International Space Station. Um, there are other, you know, China makes a, a vehicle, and uh, it was interesting, I was, I was interested to read that the President's science advisor to President Obama um, did mention that, well, we should discuss whether or not China should be a partner in the, with us and whether or not uh, we could look at using um, their, their vehicles. So that's an alternative. And also we have a commercial, uh, which I think maybe I'd put more money on as a bet, um, which is the Dragon spacecraft and SpaceX. And they're building um, vehicles right now to supply cargo for NASA as a commercial co contract. But they have a space vehicle very much like a Soyuz, three-person. Um, that they're hoping to fly in before the end of the gap. And so if that became available, NASA would buy its services. Um, on a slightly different subject, you are famous on these shows, at least of being a British-born astronaut. How important do you think it is for Britain to go ahead and join ESA and advocate a programme for British astronauts? Well, Britain is a member of ESA, um, and in fact collaborates greatly on the non-human spaceflight level. However, in human spaceflight, there has sort of been an effective embargo by the British government. And I, so, certainly that's one reason why I went to the United States um, to fulfill my dream of flying in space. Um, I, I, so I think it's, 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 uh, it's sad, it's truly it will, it will be an even more sad thing to look back at Britain and say historically that it was one of the last nations to have its own uh, nationals fly in space as part of an international space program because it, it not only inspires and motivates children to study hard and, and, and it gives them it makes them feel part of a human planet Earth sp space adventure which Britain right now doesn't have a ticket for um, but second it, 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 it misses out on all the um, those technology developments and the stimulation that it has on the industry and, and the activities of people within Great Britain uh, and very briefly um, will you be returning to space at any time in the future I'd like to. I'm considered an active astronaut. My boss told me I'm a hot backup. I consider myself both hot and a backup. Um, uh, I have flown a number of times in space, and uh, there are a number of people who need to fly before me. Uh, it's their turn. Yeah. And, uh, but if, if I could fly a mission where I don't push someone out of the queue, and I'm thinking maybe on the Russian vehicle or yeah. something, then uh, I would love to do it again, and I've got my fingers crossed. I hope you get your chance again. Yes. Okay, Dr. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.